Well, good morning. It's All Saints Day today, and I was I was thinking about um, you know kind of throughout the church year. I I was thinking of uh, All Saints Day, so you know um, Halloween slash Reformation, uh, you know, and 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 All Saints Day. Like it's one I call it the big three throughout the church year. So Reformation, All Saints Day, or Halloween, Reformation Day, and then All Saints Day. Like that's one of them. Okay. The other ones, uh, that, that time of the year when we do presents and all that stuff, baby Jesus in a, you know, in a manger and all that stuff, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. And then the third one is the other part, which is um, Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. Okay. So three, the three events, there, I mean, I'm not trying to simplify this, but just when we kind of look, this is another way to kind of look at the church here, you know, the birth of Jesus, you know, the suffering and resurrection of Jesus, and then the, the Pentecost and the, the fulfillment and kind of the continuing of, of living the Christian faith at All Saints Day. It's also a time, of course, of remembering the saints who have gone before us and what. So, but it's just, a, it's just the season of, of how we kind of move. It's, you know, it's, it's a circle, I, I like to think of it as. And so anyway, so today, All Saints Day, during the prayers of the church, we remember those who have gone before us and uh, who have who have, uh, you know, confessed their faith. And so it, uh, anyway, but just, I don't know, I like to kind of think of it this way. So I think sometimes All Saints Day gets overshadowed by that pumpkin day and uh, candy day and excess sugar and no wonder kids are going a crazy day. And, uh, uh, you know, and stuff on All Saints Day is really the big one, like Christmas and Easter. So anyway, just kind of think of it that way. Fill out your connection card. So also, since uh, November, All Saints Day is a good way to kick off. Um, and of course, uh, last Sunday was Reformation. Um, this, sun, this month, we're going to do, um, we're going to talk about the Augsburg Confession. And so I'm hoping that like by the fourth Sunday, you're going to have the same enthusiasm that you had for Leviticus, okay? I oh, and hear anybody shout, woohoo, you're supposed to, okay? Remember, woohoo, thanks. Somebody waved their hand, so that was good. Okay, and each week we're going to look at just four, okay? There's 28 uh, articles in the Augsburg Confession. We are not going to spend that long, but we're just going to look at four articles that, that help us then focus on the first and second greatest commandment, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And we're just going to kind of look at how these articles then, of course, pertain to our life because the, 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 the Augsburg Confession was the first document written, and then there's several others that were written after that, and then they, they all compiled in the Book of Concord. Some of you have heard of that, um, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I, I like reading through uh, parts of it every once in a while. Because it's edifying, not just because I'm a pastor, but because the, the documents themselves are, they were written by Christians who were struggling with their faith because other religious leaders would say things that are contrary to the word of God. And these Protestants, that's what we Lutherans are, remember, we're, we're Protestants. Sometimes Lutherans don't like to think, acknowledge that for some, but we are, okay. <clears throat> because, it, you know, we were protesting what, the, what was being taught. I mean, that's where that term comes from, okay? We were protesting, not marching with, you know, waving burning flags or something stupid like that, okay? It's, it's we're just, we're acknowledging that this Bible has the truth. It is the truth, okay, right? There's not, a, not some other document or some other person that says what's true or not true, right? It's this, Okay, and I've said this. Be I feel like I've said this before, but I believe wholeheartedly that if that as as members of our congregation, really all Christians, they should listen to the preacher, and then afterwards they should go home and they should say, "Now, did Pastor Labu what he said today, talking about the Augsburg Confession? Woohoo! Then uh, is it what's in the Bible?" That, I mean, that's, that's what we see, right? It's not just, it's, it's good to trust the pastor that he's going to teach the word of God only, but it's also very important that we as Christians, we also look through. I remember years ago, I'm going to tell this little short story and then we'll start service, but I remember years ago in a Bible study, a, a man said the exact same thing. I did not prompt him. I did not pay him. We were sitting around talking and he said to the group of about 15 people, he said, 
Pastor Labou teaches our Bible class every week, and we're really happy that he can enlighten us and help us to stay focused on the Word of God. But he said we also have to look and check to make sure that what he is teaching and preaching is in this Bible, right? And so that's, that's our obligation, all Christians, that's our obligation to, to make sure, because if this isn't the foundation, what is, all right? And you know, there's million ideas that that can be. So, so we, that's what, that's what, that's what one of the key things of the Augsburg Confession and of course these other documents were written. That's the whole, that's the key part of it is that this is the truth and this is where we get our, our direction. This is where we get our answers. Okay. And, uh, and we, and we do that then through understanding and through you know, God works through all of this. So, all right. So that was a little longer than I anticipated, but that's what we're going to be doing the next couple of weeks. So don't not come next week because you're like, Lord have mercy. I don't want to talk about the Augsburg Confession, okay? Because you're going to be missing out. Because this is what it means to be Lutheran, okay? I mean, we might sing Mighty Fortress this month just because that's a great Lutheran song. But this is really good meaty stuff. And then we're going to talk a little more about it in Bible class um, uh, the couple of weeks. So, all right? All right. So everybody still seems awake. So that's good. So okay, stand up. Let's greet those folks around us as we prepare for today. <laughs> Let's begin with our opening hymn.
congregation, please rise as you're able as we begin our service with confession and absolution. We begin our service now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. We made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious Lord, you cause your word to be proclaimed in every generation. Stir up our hearts and minds by your spirit that we may receive this proclamation with humility and finally be exalted at the coming of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. The Old Testament reading is from Micah chapter 3. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat but declare war against him, 
who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you, without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced, and the diviners, diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. As for me, I am filled with power and the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight. Who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity, its heads give judgment for, the, for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No, disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion, shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 43 responsibly. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man deliver me. You are God, Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. And I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. The Epistles from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you obtain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us the impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work on your hands as we instructed you, so that you may live properly before outsiders and to be independent on no one. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the hallelujah. <laughs>
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Glory be to you. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their flatteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord my God. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So I think we have some slides. So open up the first one, please. So this month, like I said, we're going to look at um, the Augsburg Confession and these core these beliefs. Uh, they were debated and just uh, because the church at the time, I think of it as kind of think of it as. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church of 1550 or thereabouts. Okay, so this isn't this isn't today. Okay, don't don't think of Roman Catholic Church today because at the time it was just called the Catholic Church. Okay, there was no Rome really involved. Okay, um, as things grew and all that. Anyway, I don't. That's a, another wonderful. There's like a million rabbit trails. So I have to kind of rein myself in, and I sure don't know people. You know having their eyes roll over in their head because of, you know, tired of listening to this sort of stuff, okay? 
But I want to read this, uh, this little, little snippy here um, uh, at the beginning of, um, in the book of Concord, kind of, a, it's one of the many outlines of what's going on. On June 25th, 1530, courageous Lutheran laymen confessed their faith and told the emperor and the Roman church what they believed, taught, and confessed. They relied on the promise of God's word as contained in Psalm 119, verse 46, which says, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. The Oxford Confession was presented as a statement of biblical truth and a proposal for the true unity in the Christian faith. It has never been withdrawn. So uh, if you remember watching, if you were here on the Fall Brought Fest and we watched Luther movie, and this, this was one of the scenes where they were gathered together and the emperor Charles was there and all the other uh, uh, church officials and then the Roman or the, the, lay, uh, the Lutherans as they were being called, um, those Protestants, um, you know, they were there to defend what, uh, uh, what they were being accused of, which they were being accused of causing schisms and heresies in the church, okay? Um, anyway, so I said there were 28 articles, and we're just going to look at four of them, okay? And the first one that we're going to look at um, is, uh, go to the next slide, is um, called justification, all right? Um, a, another way of s uh, saying this word is just as if I had never sinned. Okay, to be justified. Now that's simplifying it. This article is the longest article, several pages in the book of in the Augsburg Confession. And uh, uh, to justify means to declare righteous. God's sure and certain declaration that we are righteous in His eyes is possible only because of our Savior Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, just a minute ago, another way is to look at it is to be justified is to just as if I had never sinned. All right, so. Um, I'm also going to, you know, we're just going to look at it. Might as well see what it is. If, if you have a book of Concord at home, great. If you don't, here you go. I'll just give you the little snippet, okay? This is just the short one. Um, one other little side note, in the, in the book of Concord, there are basically, there's the short version of the Augsburg Confession, okay? And then the, um, the longer version is called the apology. It's not apologizing for something. That's just the word that they used, and it's a fuller explanation. So this is the short summary version that we're going to be looking at here, okay? To justification means also they teach that men cannot be justified. They're talking about the non-Lutherans, okay? That would be the, the Roman church at this time, okay? They teach that men cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merits, or works, but are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith. When they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, who by his death has made sa satisfaction for our sins? This faith God imputes for righteousness in his sight. All right. I am sorry that there's a lot of good stuff here. I mean, I think it's good. Okay. Uh, just bear with me. Okay. You're going to think it's good after a little while, I'm sure. Okay. Um, but there's just, uh, it's a lot of kind of meaty stuff. Okay. But remember, this, this was serious. Okay. The, what Luther, what happened in the Luther movie, raise your hand if you actually watched it, either at the thing or whatever. Okay. All right. So you remember some of what's happened, right? Okay. Lots of excitement. A lot of shouting, a lot of, you know, good Lutheran stuff, okay? It was, it was great. And, uh, but this is serious because the, at what becomes then, we know, as the Roman church, again, think of Roman church of 1550 or 1530, all right? They were teaching things that were not in the Bible, or, they were, or, or, or the, the church was saying that, you know, the Pope can decide what the, what the Bible says, or they were saying that other people within the church could decide what the Bible says, all right? So the Lutherans, the, the Protestants, they were saying that is not correct. That's not what's in the Bible, all right? I mean, I harp on it, and I, I think that's one thing about us Lutherans is I think that's one reason why we're good at education, okay? Every time a church was started in America, what was started first? Right. I always thought, why didn't they start with the sanctuary? They started with the school, okay? And then they worshiped in the school, and then they built the church, all right? Because education is so important, not just to know what two and two equal, okay, but what is God teaching us, Okay? 
small catechism, you know, using that. So these core materials to teach the children to grow in the faith and knowledge of what Jesus has done for them, that it is Jesus alone that saves us. You know this, okay? But it's good to be reminded of these things. We see this all throughout the scriptures, particularly in the Old Testament. The prophets, you know, after one after another after another is teaching justification, okay? They don't use those exact words, but, but that's what's happening, okay? Reminding the people of God's word, his law, which is important. Remember, we have to have both, okay? These are the rules. God wants us to follow them because this is how God wants us to live, all right, always think of, the, think of the Ten Commandments that way. The Ten Commandments is how God wants us to live. Okay? Not a list of, if I do these things correctly, God will do something for me. That's another one of the million heresies that the Augsburg Confession and the other documents are, are preaching against. Okay? All right, go to our next one, our next slide. So, um, the faith, this faith that God imputes for righteousness in his sight. So in, in back in Genesis 15, we see where it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous. Okay, Abraham did not act righteously. Remember, remember Abraham was born in a pagan, a pagan home. Okay, sometimes we like to, we like to have this beautiful, soft colored. Some kids' books are terrible about this, okay? They just, they just make it so soft and beautiful, okay? Not that kids need to hear everything awful, okay? But remember, Abraham, pagan, right, okay? We know what he had become, okay, by God's grace, which we're getting at, okay? Abraham did not act righteously. God declared him righteous because of his faith. Faith itself is credited for righteousness. Faith is the thing that God declares to be righteous. Paul adds that righteousness is credited freely, all right? So Abraham believed, and, it, and God counted him as righteousness. So God looked at Abraham, and he picked him out of his pagan home, and he set him apart, and he declared him, because remember, he's a pagan. All he knows is sin. Okay? I mean, he probably didn't think of it as sin, but, but he did, because it was against the word, Right? All right, we're going to look at our text from Romans chapter 3. So if you want to open your pew Bible, it's on page 797, Romans chapter 3. We're going to just look at a couple of verses here. Romans chapter 3, again, it's page 797. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So we are made righteous because of Jesus, right? Because he willingly died for us, even though every one of us, when we woke up today, you probably sinned some way, all right? You don't have to shout it out what it is, and if you know what your neighbor's sin was, don't be shouting that one out either, okay? We confessed our sins at the beginning of this service because of that, right? So we receive, we come, we, we confess our sins, we admit we've said or done something against God and somebody else, because every time you sin, it's against God and somebody else, right? It's not just, well, I sinned against God, which is, which is even worse, okay? We sin against God and somebody else. But then what did we receive? What words did I speak to you afterwards? His forgiveness, Right? That's wonderful. We have that peace and that joy and that peace because of Jesus and his words. It has nothing to do with me, okay? You know, Doug could have been standing up here when he was reading the gospel. He could have given you, forgiven you your sins because he would be speaking God's word of truth to you, okay? It's not about him. It's not about me. All right? So we're made righteous. And it says here that... Uh, um, uh, let's see, um, where am I? This righteousness, verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
And I, I love that sentence. I love that. Okay, it's just that's it. That's the encapsulation, encapsulation of, you know, what's going on here. That God willingly forgives us even though we have sinned. Okay? We sinned and yet he, we come to him and we, we confess our sins and he willingly forgives us. And then Jesus died on that cross. Okay? This one's better because we see Jesus actually on it. And Jesus died for us willingly because he is the only one that we know that can fulfill this. Everything that happens to our faith comes from, from outside of us. What on earth could you do or give to God that would, that would make you have faith? Nothing is a rhetorical question. Nothing. You can't, you can't, okay? I, you know, I, I remember a pastor once saying, this dead tree that I was cut down in his backyard, this dead tree cannot come back to life, can it? Once you cut it down, it's done. All right? God can make that tree grow again if he wants, okay? Now, he, he doesn't just, you know, put it back up on where it was and, you know, and, and fix it, okay? But the same with us, okay? We're, we, are, we are dead on our trespasses and our sins, okay? And yet, we are justified freely, just as if we had not sinned. We are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. He gives us this opportunity every day to confess our sins and to receive his forgiveness and then to live the way he asks us to live, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, I, you know, I, I remember even hearing some people tell me this, that it, it's hard to, you know, it's easy to do the first, but it's hard to do the second. Well, that, that may be. It's, it's, it might be easy to love God. And, you know, uh, maybe you think, well, it's not as messy. I'm not really sure why, because God's the one who created mess. And, uh, you know, he's bigger than anything. But, uh, but you say, well, it's harder to love my neighbor as myself, okay? But, it, but it's possible with God, because with all things God thought with God, all things are possible. So our next slide here, we'll look at what Moses says in Deuteronomy. All right, sorry for the print being a little small there. He says, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Okay? With these words I command you today shall be on your heart. Here is, is kind of what the, the doing part. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you get up. You shall bind them as signs on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. All right? So you should engage with God's word in every aspect of your life. Okay? Are you a Christian just this morning, and then, you know, tomorrow you go to work, and then you're like, well, I'm not a Christian? Or are you a Christian all the time? All right? We should diligently engage with it all the time. If we, in order to teach it to your children then you, or your grandchildren, then you need to know it yourself, right? Because you need to know something if you're going to teach your kids or your grandkids something. All right, we can talk of them when you sit at home, when you walk by the way. I always think of that when you're out shopping, okay? When you lie down, when you get up, we should talk of them and think about them. Okay, and then verse 8 and 9 or verse 8, you shall bind them as signs on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Our gospel lesson pointed this out, where it talked about the Pharisees believed that if they actually took a little, little box, a little, a little box with a strap on it, and they put Bible passages in it, okay? And then they would tie this little box, just a little, I always think of like a, a square pill box or whatever, and they would tie that on their hand, and then they would tie it on their forehead, okay? Because that's what God said, all right? I mean, personally, I think that is ridiculous, okay? Because nowhere in this, in this text does it say, now literally, go make a little box. No, okay? But that's what the Pharisees did. And that's what the gospel, we see that a little bit in the gospel lesson. Bind them as a sign on your hand. They should be as front lips between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I remember also hearing this one time about with the, with the little box taped, strapped to their head that's got, it's also has Bible passage in it, that remember some Jews would wear um, um, an outfit that often had um, uh, tassels on the ends of the shirt, for example. And then the tassels would also remind them of the Ten Commandments and God's Word. And all of that is good, except, like anything, we can abuse it. Or we just, we, we just neglect it. 
It's just there. We just do it. You know, and, and I think that can be a problem for some of us too sometimes where we, we just do something because we don't even think about it. We come, we sit in the pew, and we sing some hymns, listen to the pastor yap on for a little bit, sing some more hymn, have coffee, and go home. And, oh, that's fine, but, I mean, are you really worshiping? Are you really receiving from God? You are, okay, irrespective, because, again, this is God working, the Spirit working in us, okay? But God encourages us to, to, to do, I mean, I mean, these are some of the to-dos of engaging with the Word in a variety of ways, talking with your family, with your friends, engaging with it. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, verse 9, to write it on your doorpost in your house, the idea is, again, it's, it should always kind of be present there, okay? You don't have to literally write it uh, painted on your gate, you know? I was thinking about one of our neighbors in our neighborhood. You know, they got a wooden fence, and they were just painting it yesterday. And I was thinking about this verse, and I thought, well, that might be kind of interesting if they, you know, painted the Ten Commandments on this wooden fence that's right there facing the road and big, big, wide stretch of fence. And, okay, I mean, you, you can do that, but, you know, uh, you know, that's for then people looking at their house. That's not really the people that live there uh, to see it, but uh, anyway... But the idea is that we engage it. That's how we, we, when we engage with God's word, which I say all the time, and uh, which to me is so vitally important because as a Christian, if you're not filled up, filled up with the truth, with the word, then what are you filled up with? Well, hopefully you're filled up with the truth, all right? So we, and then as we know that truth, then we are able to love God above all things and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But because we want to, because we want to love God above all things. Because we want to love our neighbors as ourselves. Not because the pastor says that we have to or that, you know, you read this here. But because we want to do this. When we, when we, when we fill up and when we know that truth and the Spirit nurtures and creates that in us, that truth and that faith in us, that desire, that interest, then, we, then, we, then we've got something to stand on, Right? The, the next slide here, I said, you know, this, I love this, you know, this hymn. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven, he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood, he bought her. And for her life, he died. I love that, that hymn because it's just a reminder, again, of is, is who's doing the work, all right? What are, what are you doing in this work? Well, you're not, you're, you're receiving this because that's what God, he's, he, wants, he wants us. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to, to be with him so that we can spend now together, but also eternity together. The church has one foundation. Is, we, we receive the water and the word from baptism and, and Holy Communion. From heaven, Jesus came and he sought her. He, he looked for us. He brought us out to be his holy bride. With his own blood, he bought her. And for her life, he died. We are justified. We are, it is made holy and righteous, just if we had never sinned by what Jesus has done for us. And, and I'm just kind of scratching the surface here with these messages about the Augsburg Confession and, and, and the other, other documents but I, I think it's so wonderful that we, you know, we have such a rich um, foundation. Our foundation is Jesus Christ, is Lord, our, our Lord, and, and, and his holy word that he's given us. And then these other documents, they all point to Jesus. They all point to the Bible, okay? I remember once someone once saying to me, they said, Oh, you Lutherans have another book, just like the Mormons. Okay. I mean, it can look that way, okay? But when you read the documents in the book Concord, you're going to see that it's all pointing to the cross. It's all pointing to Jesus. It's not pointing to Martin Luther or, or Emmanuel Lutheran Congregation or some, you know, or the LCMS. It's not pointing to any of that. It's pointing to Jesus Christ, our Lord. She is our, he is our one foundation. And so, you know, let people, you know, people say things oftentimes out of, uh, sometimes out of ignorance because they just don't know. All right, well, well, we don't need to chide them for, for not knowing. Encourage them to read, uh, encourage them first to read the Bible. All right? Don't let them start with the Augsburg Confession. 
They don't know the, if they don't know much about Jesus or they seem confused, help them to read, you know, encourage them. Start with the Gospel of John or some other easy book. Don't start with Leviticus. Woohoo! Even though, you know, that's a good book to read. All right. But start with something to, to point others to Christ. And that's how we love God. But then ultimately, that's how we love our neighbors as ourselves when we are, when we are filled up with that truth and the Spirit working through us. For it, is, it, for it is by grace through faith that you and I have been saved from going to hell. And we have received the gift of God from, from, from God, our Heavenly Father, of eternal life. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds, found in the one true faith of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please rise as you're able as we confess our faith, faith now in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the God and His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, you got to not me. Being the one substance of the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was imparted by the Holy Spirit of the perfect Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in the conscious power. He suffered and was buried, and in the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand. Father, and he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped to glorify, who is loved by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge all baptism and permission to sin. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, send your spirit to the ministers of the church who bring the good news of Christ's death and resurrection, that they may work through the preaching of gather the lost kindle faith in those who do not yet believe, and sustain us all to the day of Christ's coming. We therefore pray for Pastor Matt Harrison, our LCMS president, Pastor Alan Buss, our Northern Illinois district president, Pastor Carl Fay, our circuit visitor, and all pastors in our area. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for the men serving on the board of elders at our congregation. We pray for your spirit to lead and guide them with your word that they will make decisions that will glorify you and will edify our church. Lord, in your mercy, we pray and thank you, Lord God, for your holy word. Encourage us daily to read or listen to your word so that we will regularly fill up with this truth and be reminded that this truth sets people free. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for the opportunity you give our congregation to serve you by serving our neighbors through the food pantry and Connecting Point Cafe. We pray for our members who serve in these capacities, that, they're, that the light of Jesus would shine through them to those who come so that more people see Jesus in their words and actions. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, be with our church and all our members who belong to you by baptism and faith at the bidding of, your lamb, of the Lamb, our shepherd, Give us ears to hear your word and faith to receive him in his blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Gentle Lord, visit the homes of your people that they may be places where faith is nurtured and where we learn to live our new lives in holiness and righteousness. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for our leaders, for the the, um, nation, for the state, and for the local area. We pray, therefore, President Biden, Vice President Harris, the men and women in the House of Representatives, the men and women in the Senate, the Supreme Court Justices, Illinois Governor Pritzker, and Des Plaines Mayor Goskowski. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the service of the men and women in our community serving in the fire department, the police department, and all first responders. 
Send your spirit into their lives to encourage them and equip them daily to serve you where you have called them. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those serving um, our country in the various branches of the armed forces. We pray your spirit to also strengthen them daily. They serve where you have called them, that they will be encouraged to serve wholeheartedly. Lord, in your mercy, faithful God, we commend ourselves, our body, soul, and all things into your keeping. Deliver us into your righteousness from all that would harm our bodies or assault our souls. Lord, in your mercy, we pray, Lord, for our members, uh, friends, and our family members who are struggling with their health and well-being, including Dean, Diane, Marie, uh, Eugene, Irma, Marlene, Jean, Irene, Fran, and Walter, Kathleen, Marion, Carol, Phil and Susan, Alexandra, Lindsay, John. We pray, Lord, uh, for all of these folks that you would heal them according to your will and in your time. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for uh, those celebrating birthdays, including Jerry and Tammy and Ed. We pray a blessing upon them, Lord, uh, as they uh, move forward uh, with another year of life that you've granted to them. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant that we may be brought to everlasting life with the faithful who have gone before us, who now rest from their labors. We thank and praise you for the witnesses of um, Ken Markworth, uh, Lucille Leager, Mary Phillips, Barb Buslovich, Nancy Clayton, Jeanette Moshman, and Vicki Mayer. We thank you, Lord God, for all that you allowed them to serve and do, and we praise and thank you, Lord, for their witness. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercies through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we'll continue now with the service of sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, By his glorious resurrection opened us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, and for more praising you and singing. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. 
Congregation, please rise for the new commitments. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing
Well, good morning once again. All right, so um, I was just thinking about this during our last hymn that if you um, don't have a book of Concord or don't know what it is, you should just call me here at the church or email me and I'll, I'll uh, touch base with you about it. You can buy one on Concordia Publishing House's website or on Amazon. And um, the, the, the newest edition of it, basically what they've done is they have re kind of, they have repackaged it. They haven't changed anything, but they repackaged it so that it's a very user-friendly, um, so that non-pastors who might be somewhat interested, maybe they were attending a worship service somewhere and their pastor started yapping about the Augsburg Confession, they can read the, con it's called Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, and it's got, a, it's a reader's edition. And so it's got a, a reading plan in the front. So you can read through the entire Book of Concord, press the heck out of the pastor if you want to do so, all right? Even if you read some of it, you'd still impress the heck out of the pastor. So uh, uh, anyway, um, but I'm just putting this little plug out there, okay? Because it's just one of the things, uh, again, the, the Book of Concord isn't just supposed to be a big, lofty theological thing way up here that nobody cares about except pastors, maybe, all right? It's stuff that pertains to us, all right? We're Lutherans. That's why we have this. I mean, that's where we, we know the kind of the result of that. So anyway, but, and the little blurb, again, kind of gives you an outline of what we're doing. So pick one of those up if you didn't last time. There's a sign-up sheet uh, in the back there um, at the information desk. So uh, sign up if you would like me to come. I was wanted to remind or kind of ask about um, the stewardship committee is still trying to encourage us members to tithe 1% a little bit each month. Hold on a second. Okay, and we'll be ready. 1%. And so um, in the September, October, it should be 2% tithing. Okay. And uh, um, so, hey, come back here. Come back here and say my dad. Come back here. So I'm, I'm, they want to just encourage you because, again, the idea behind tithing is simply trusting God with our money and our resources. Okay. It's not a matter of um, the church wants your money because the church. I mean, we might need it, but really we don't because we're, if we're trusting God, then he's going to provide, okay, for our congregation, for us individually. So I just, I'm just kind of put that plug of reminder from the stewardship committee because I know they're trying to encourage us little by little to tithe what we're capable of and what we're able because, again, everything we have comes from God and it's reminding ourselves that God is the one in charge of everything we have. So... Um, Today is First Sunday, First Sunday Fellowship. We'll just kind of, we're going to start that up again. First Sunday of the month, we'll have fellowship, so there won't be a Bible class. So anybody that was really gung-ho, ready to dig into the Augsburg Confession Bible Study, you're just going to have to hold that excitement until next week, okay? Um, right, thanks. See, that's the response you should have, so uh, that's good. I appreciate that. So anyway, uh, uh, I think that should be enough. Anything else? Uh, nope. All right. The Lord. Thank you, God. <laughs>